Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining me and everyone here and welcome Justin and Carmody. Uh, we are hosting just uh, an interrogation into where we find courage in these times and I hope it's going to be just a helpful uh, discussion to explore some of that stuff. We've seen um, this week uh, enormous amounts of people going out and taking nonviolent direct action including hundreds if not thousands of scientists um, around the world and uh, we're filming this on uh, Friday so the day before rebellion and just yesterday we had a, a large group of doctors and, and nurses and healthcare professionals locked onto oil barrels and blocking the road outside the British Treasury on the day that they released their new energy policy. So it's a big week and we've had the comments from Antonio Guterres about you know how activists are actually not extremists but perhaps the people expanding fossil fuels are extremists um, so I think it's a very interesting time to sort of ask ourselves where we're finding the courage to carry on it feels very topsy-turvy to me that we're hearing one thing and looking out the window and seeing something yeah. that doesn't really fit <laughs> so um, I'll let you guys introduce yourself uh, for the audience so do you want to go for it Carmody? Well, thanks, Claire. Um, well, it's great to be in this. Um, it's great to be in this conversation, um, even though nobody would wish an occasion like this uh, for such a conversation. But it is great to be here all the same. So my name is Carmody Gray, and um, I I work in the Department for uh, of Theology and Religion at the University of Durham. Um, I, I work in core areas of philosophy and theology and ethics. Um, and I, I didn't ever set out to be a climate specialist and I'm not an activist uh, by nature at all. I can come back to that in a little bit, but my involvement in, in um, th this conversation came about not because I have a kind of personal interest in it as such, although I am really interested in science and nature and environment and I always have been, uh, but it's not my core thing. I got involved in it because my day job, if you like, is thinking about values, is thinking about what's true and good and beautiful uh, what human beings live for, what they care about, what we should uh, stand for in our life and in this world. And the, <laughs> the time we live in requires that I therefore think the climate. It's not in any way the case that I, uh, you know, that, that, that I have a, a specialist knowledge. It's more that to be a person thinking about values uh, and goods in this time actually compels one to engage with the climate. And dare I say it, um, not just to engage with it, but to take a stand. And I can say more about that in a second, but Justin, maybe you want to introduce yourself first. Great, thanks, Carmody. Yeah, Justin Kenrick, I'm based in Edinburgh. Um, I'm an anthropologist. Um, I'm kind of the opposite in that I'm an activist who became an academic for 10 years when my kids were little and I needed to have a proper job. And as soon as <laughs> they grew old enough for me to be able to go back to Africa, I, I work with forest people in Africa, trying to help them uh, stay on their lands when they're being evicted by palm oil corporations and so on. So, um, yeah, I'm an activist, I think, from when I was born. Uh, my parents were very involved in housing and, and I was grew up in Notting Hill when it was a slum, not a kind of posh place for David Cameron and co. And, uh, and so I kind of was around people who cared about other people and people who were looking at suffering. And I guess that's where my Courage, coming back to the question we're going to be looking at, but just the kind of the sense of courage comes from, I guess the word comes from the heart, doesn't it? The French word for the heart. So it comes from that care for others and a caring for others makes you a lot happier as a person than not caring for others. So there's just something about we get taught that, you know, be selfish and you'll be better off. And actually it's a load of nonsense. Look at the kind of warped faces of those with power and those or the glossy faces of those who are concealing the kind of the pain. And you kind of then you look at the people around you. When you're taking action on the streets and you're looking at people who are doctors or lecturers or plumbers or unemployed or whatever else and you're looking at all these diverse people and you're looking at that deep care and often quite worn faces but just that real humanity and courage comes mm. from that connection with those around you and, and mm -hmm. mm. yeah wow well, thanks justin um about the activism thing this is maybe a good moment to say uh something that i've been thinking a lot since i got involved in in just a ball and extinction rebellion and that kind of thing and this is maybe a word for those who don't feel so comfortable describing themselves as activists or thinking of themselves as activists. I'm, um, I don't have any kind of innate attraction to what most people understand by activism. Um, and that's not for any particularly good reason. It's just that that's not how my history unfolded. That's not the kind of person I am. That's not the, the taste I have. And I, 
I don't, um, you know, I don't like conflict and I don't like disharmony. I don't like disorder. And that makes me sound like I'm really kind of controlling. I'm not at all. It's just, I, I've never sort of migrated there. But mm. the thing that's, that's changed for me is that there, there are so many issues worth being activist about. There always have been. And I've always been an admirer of those who do go out on the streets and do something about it. Huge admirer and often wish that I had the, you know, the, the, the kind of wherewithal to do that myself. But it seems like some kind of line has been crossed for me that activism is no longer, this is the key thing, and maybe this is, this is the intersection with courage. Activism is no longer one of the things that a person might do who cares about these issues. Mm. It's become the only intelligible response mm. to a situation in which an act of collective madness is running unchecked and all of the usual methods by which democratic and orderly societies make good decisions have failed. Mm. I think Gutierrez really captures it when he says, activists are no longer the extremists. Mm. Activism is no longer something that a few people might do who feel especially strongly about something. Mm. Activism has become, as I said, the only intelligible and intelligent response to the failure of all other methods. And that I think is in a way, um, not to put it too dramatically, but that's what I'm doing in this conversation. Uh, that's how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. It's because at some point the pressure to have that particular kind of courage that is involved in activism mm -hmm. became, as it were, intolerable. I could no longer try to simply try to exercise influences in other ways. It became an unavoidable conclusion to, to, to become an activist. That's That's... Can I jump in there? Because it's like, that's lovely. I love your, we're coming from very different places here, which is great. So for me, kind of activism is kind of like just normal and what people do. And we've been taught that it's something odd and extreme. So I'm coming at it quite the opposite to you. I mean, we're in the same place, but from different directions. And, uh, and so activism is like people care for each other is really activism. People are willing to take a step across mm. the road to help somebody who's hungry. People, it's just like, that's a normal. When I go working in Africa and elsewhere, you know, it's normal that you make sure people around you aren't hungry. That's really mm. cool. It's really rare to walk past people being hungry. It's a very weird society where it's okay to walk past somebody who's hungry or somebody who's homeless. Mm. So where I work in Africa, people are very poor. Materially, they haven't got that much. They're very rich. It's, it's, it's a fine, as long as they've got their land, which when they're thrown off, then they're really poor with nothing. I mean, there's that history here in Scotland and in England, the enclosures and the clearances, the kind of the clearance yeah. in the land, making people insecure, making you reliant on a system of, of domination rather than reliant on each other. So activism to me is more just like a normal human way of being with each other. And it's then painted yeah. in, a, in a framework of domination, which we kind of live in. It's then painted as this weird thing when actually it's just really normal. You see the house is on fire, you do something about it. That's what we're seeing here. We're, lots of us are living at the top of that house and we think it's just burning. Yeah, yeah. It it's coming up, it's hurting people right now. Do something about it. So. So I, I, I love the way that you're coming at it from a different angle. But for me, it's like activism is just a really normal thing that everybody would do in most societies. But in our society, mm -hmm. it's made into this odd thing where you care. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Quite normal to care, guys. You know, what's the truth? Yeah. That's so interesting. That's so interesting, Justin. I've never, I've never thought about it like that. And of course, on that level, if activism is simply, if you like, a synonym for um, being willing to act, like at the literal level of the etymology, being willing to act when the circumstances require it, then basic, you know, it, it's the most basic exercise of human responsibility, activism. And I think there's something about, you know, speaking to our particular moment, there's something about the way in which activism has been defined and pigeonholed that, is, that has really not been good for the climate movement in particular, because it's, the, the narrative has presented people who take these um, steps, uh, the, the going onto the street steps, as people who are in some kind of radical discontinuity with other kinds of care or other kinds of responsibility, mm -hmm. rather than simply being what responsibility looks like in a time like this. You know, That's sometimes it looks like feeding the person next door. Other times it looks like, you know, um, trying to stop oil refineries. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, an example is for me would be, Claire was asking me to talk about this court case I had last April um, when I was found it, found not guilty uh, by a judge, which was the first time somebody, you know, those of us who have been through quite a lot of court cases for XR, I've got another one coming up in a few weeks, um, but uh, I was found not guilty and it was, it was a very, uh, that was quite a confusing moment to be found not guilty by this judge. 
And it was quite funny also because there was one XR person in the, as a support person who was, who'd complained to me that I hadn't been emotional enough in the, uh, prior to the kind of, you know, the, with the judge going out to make his judgment. And he was a lovely guy there supporting me. Um, but it was in the middle of COVID. And uh, I had a granddaughter who was born like a few weeks earlier, and I wasn't allowed to travel from Edinburgh down to London because of COVID regulations. And now I was legally obliged to travel down to London, yay, to this court case. So I got down and I saw my granddaughter. So I went and then cycled across London, which was empty because of you know, COVID. So I cycled across London to Magistrates Court, City of London Magistrates Court, and arrived there. And I was in a blissful state because I'd just seen my granddaughter. So it was like, I went into this court case. So I was in the wrong emotional state from a kind of activist point of view, like you're describing, a kind of protest point of view, how we're painted and how we can paint ourselves. I was just there as a really happy granddad. Um, and then there was the judge there. And, and I was approaching it very much like, you know, your job is to keep us safe. The police and the courts, that's your job is to keep people safe. That's what you do. That's the whole point of you being here. So I wasn't in an adversarial place, like I've been arrested, mm. arrested me yeah. all you're a bad judge and you're gonna, I, I did want to say, I'd planned to say to him, you know, I should be getting a jury because juries will find me innocent and judges won't. I was all ready to be activist in that confrontational sense that you, I think you were alluding to. But mm. I, wasn't, I was there as this happy guy going, hi, I'm really happy to be here. And um, I'm not happy about climate change. And it's really appalling. I've just come back from Kenya and what's happening there as a result of climate change is horrendous. And it's happening right now. Yeah. And then was talking about cycling and about his kids and kind of justifying his own and saying he cared about the climate too. It was really quite a nice conversation. Mm. It was really. I think that's such an interesting story, um, Justin. That's an important story because the public perception of activists is that they are angry and confrontational. Mm. And that's, of course, <laughs> That makes sense because the situation is a, a situation about which it is reasonable to be angry. It's not that anger is an irrational response. And it's, of course, also in a certain sense, necessarily confrontational in the sense that it's presenting a genuine, you know, it's called civil resistance for a force. It's presenting a genuine force of, of resistance to um, uh, something that simply cannot be cannot be allowed to go on. Right. But what you describe is ultimately a far better act of witness and a far richer act of witness because, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot in the past weeks um, and months, because it represents and, and testifies to the fact that we're basically on the same side. Mm. Human beings are all on the same side. Mm. We all want to share this earth mm. in the future. We all want a habitable future. Mm. And somehow, the process of climate activism needs to have that feeling that it's for and behalf and on behalf of everybody. Mm. That it's not a mainly an against movement, it's mainly a for movement. And it may be that certain people, for reasons that are you know, worth exploring, of course, that certain people don't see that that is really for them, mm. but then the burden is on, as far as it can be possible, uh, the burden is on activists to show that this courage that they're exercising to pick up on this key word right that Claire mentioned this courage that they're exercising is a courage on behalf of all humanity mm. it's not adversarial at its deepest level it may kind of manifest in an adversarial way but at the deepest level it's an act of solidarity of trying to bring everybody together mm. into a future that is actually possible for everybody really good way of putting it so there's a big difference between that kind of grounding in love to put it crudely I mean but fundamentally that solidarity and care and then there's and then the system which is destroying us <laughs> it just is I mean, yeah. the, I mean just an economic system that is by its logic thinking that you can grow everything and that you don't have to redistribute because you can always get more and so which is just doesn't make any logical sense on a finite yeah. planet just like so you don't have to blame anybody in particular but the system is insane and is destroying yeah. us but I guess you know when I was talking about judge I was a privileged white guy educated guy you know and he could see me as somebody like him and so I'm, I don't want to underplay the fact mm -hmm. that it's okay for me to do that but for somebody else who's going to be suffering daily by virtue of how they look or where they're positioned or their you know lack of wealth or whatever else I look like the guy who's the judge you know I mean I'm yeah. maybe, maybe I don't to you but that's how he was seeing me and yeah. and you know so he could he could then respond with kind of 
reclaiming his humanity, which he did. It was a real shock, his judgment. And of course, he just spoke his judgment. So I only found out what he'd actually said when I got the transcript because the Crown appealed against, because they didn't want somebody found innocent. Um, so I then could see what his actual judgment was. And it's like, oh God, right. Because I didn't believe him. Even when he did, came to the judgment, I thought it must be a technical issue here, but it wasn't. It was him going, mm. this crisis means that we need to take action. You know, and that was quite mm. extraordinary. So totally mm. with you. fundamentally we're in solidarity, but also we need to see that there's a, the system that we're up against and that we need to transform is one that makes everybody unequal in that process. So one person's response anger, as you said earlier, is utterly appropriate. And somebody else's response of being, you know, as I was, very friendly is perfectly fine in that place. So it's like allowing people to be where they are on that spectrum and, and activism involves all of that. And we should all be activists. Everybody actually is activists and they're either taking action to help or taking action which doesn't help. Everybody's actually involved. Yeah, that's right. Everybody's acting. Everybody. Yeah. And the question is not shall we act, but what kind of action do we undertake? Absolutely. Absolutely. And maybe um, maybe that's a good a good way into noticing that we all need courage, hmm. but the amounts of courage actually vary quite a lot depending on who we are to start with. Because people have different amounts at stake in the system and different amounts to lose from the risks that are involved in taking these kinds of actions. And I think you, you put that really well, Justin, you know, as being the person that you are is a very different experience standing in the dock to being somebody for whom, against whom, the dice are already loaded in the justice system. And recognising that, recognising that, you know, what requires not very much courage from me might require huge amounts of courage from somebody else, or indeed that there are different kinds of actions that are more costly for me and more frightening for me as compared to somebody else because maybe I have more to lose mm. for yeah. example in, in certain contexts and just seeing the differentiated character of that is important and that connects with the you know what we were just saying about if this is a movement for everybody and it must be both in the sense that it's a movement on behalf of everybody and the sense that it's a movement which everybody feels able to join and be part of then recognizing that differentiated way in which people participate and experience these actions is really crucial to yeah. making it collective, to making it open. Yeah. I think that's been really difficult to hold actually as well um, in some ways, because whilst you want to hold a movement together that says everyone's welcome, bring what you can, do what you can, try to step out of your comfort zone it's even sort of in the principles and values of xr that we will go outside of our comfort zone in the work that we'll be committed to to try to do that <clears throat> it then becomes quite challenging i think to um to to know how to encourage people and um i guess one of the things that i was thinking about the word courage and having discussions on this. First of all, that there's the there's the the word for for heart in the in in that word, and that I think it does require like a very open-hearted sort of vulnerable strength to be courageous and to find courage. But then a friend of mine said that is this that is also isn't it interesting? It's n courage, which is like what does that mean I've never thought about the fact that courage is in the word encourage mm. actually um but in terms of sort of encouraging each other to sort of do that next thing I think there's quite a lot of people for this rebellion for example who've been part of the movement for a long time and are saying I'm going to do I'm going to do that next step this time I'm going to sit in the road and I will refuse to leave and I will face um arrest I will do that and I'm I'm kind of ready if mm. you like and I guess what I'm curious about is what gets people to that position where they're personally ready to step out of lawful behaviours and into something which I think is actually, you know, very taboo in, in, in British society in a way to sort of go out and intentionally sort of break the law, tell everybody about it, film it admit it you know um there's something that i think people find very strange about that behavior when when you do it on mass and they definitely did when i first started doing this work with civil disobedience um but what do you i guess what do you think justin about what what happens when people sort of say okay 
I'm going to make a very measured decision here. I'm going to step over that line because I think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, that's that's that sounds really right. It feels like it's a combination of desperation and hope. So it's like, you know, it's a real desperation in looking at the truth in the eyes. So it's tell the truth, you know, see the tell the truth to yourself primarily <laughs> of the situation we're in and how drastic it is, but also the the hope. And it doesn't have to be hope for an outcome, but it's the hope, it's it's courage calling to courage everywhere. That lovely saying, I can't remember who, the suffragette that's in Parliament Square, you know, that she's holding that banner saying courage calls to courage everywhere. So there's just something about that infectiousness of courage, of of taking action, of hope. So there's something about that. You don't have to hope for a particular outcome, but just that willingness to, to stand up and be counted and to or sit down and be counted, sit down and be arrested. Um, is So I think it's the desperate, it's the combination of those two that is really, um, and it's something about those, the three demands for me are demands of ourselves. So telling the truth, acting now and trusting ourselves, which for me are the three demands of XR, are demands primarily of ourselves. And I think there's a shift happening in the movement more generally, not just in XR, but more generally just from demanding of government, which we still need to do, but knowing that actually government won't deliver. They can't deliver. They're caught up, posh boys caught up in their own personal traumas from early on and trying to deal with it in their weird ways. I've got no ability to, to help really. So we need to carry on demanding, but the real demand is of ourselves collectively as a society. And we can regain that power and actually really trust ourselves to take action. So we need to do use protests, use democratic system and so on, but fundamentally it's about reorienting. And we saw that at the start of COVID, certainly up here in Scotland in the first lockdown, just people realizing that community mattered, realizing that nature mattered, seeing the immense inequality of the impacts and the key workers and who's earning. So it's just something like about the truth that was revealed then about who we really are, which is caring people and how the system is, which is utterly unequal and unfair. I think there's a real seeing of the truth happening and telling of the truth. That is, I think it happened at a body level with COVID in a sense, just like, oh, right. So I think there's something that's shifted since the April and October rebellions that, you know, the big ones before that's in 2019, there's been a big shift. Obviously we were blocked by COVID from being able to take action in that, that way. But I feel there's been a bodily shift in society to recognition both of the drastic nature of what we're up against, but also of, we're not what the five billionaire print, you know, print guys, media guys try and tell us every day we are, which is that we're selfish and out for ourselves. We're actually something much more than that. So it's recovering that sense of who we really are that I think is at the, the heart of the courage. Oh, that's so great, Justin. That's really, really great. Sorry, Claire. Well, I was just going to say that's something that I've really noticed in the coverage about blockading oil. Um, the recent sort of newspapers uh, reports that I've seen from the sort of right wing um, have been saying, calling the protesters the selfish minority. And I find it so interesting and horrifying that that again is like it's an absolute inversion of the truth there are a selfish minority causing this situation in many ways blocking action stopping the things that should be happening and um you know some young people chained to each other weeping with fear are are, are being are being described but the, job, but the job of that media is to protect those interests by telling everybody that they're selfish. Fundamentally, it's telling us that we're not OK and we need them to make the world OK. I mean, so that, that's their job. It's not surprising when we think, why is the media doing this? It's like, well, that's their job. I don't mean the actual job of being a journalist, but I mean, in that system, in terms of who's going to be employed and who's not. That lovely Chomsky interview with Andrew Marr, do you remember that one where he, Andrew Marr is saying, are you telling me that I'm, I'm sitting here being biased? And you say, no, but you wouldn't be sitting here interviewing me unless you'd already been selected as somebody who would keep the status quo going. So it's, anyway, sorry, Harmony. Oh, that's just all, it's all so, um, it's all so powerful. I, I, as I've thought about this issue more generally over recent years, it's become apparent to me that negative narratives about human beings drive apathy and lack of courage. And they drive a sense of hopelessness about the future. And I think you're really, really onto something, Justin. The number of times that I've spoken to audiences about um, kind of cl climate and environmental change and people will say at the end, well, yes, it's, it's because we're all selfish, isn't it? Mm. And I always say, no, it isn't. It isn't because we're all selfish. We're not selfish, you know, or, or rather to the extent that we are, we're no more or less selfish than we ever were. It's not that we've all suddenly become bad. It's that in all kinds of, very difficult to analyze um, and subtle ways. We're now carried by a system that doesn't actually serve what's good for us. Mm. 
that doesn't that's not because any individual is out there you know doing devilish work maliciously destroying the future the system has got a life of its own and it's carrying us all along with it and part of that is um of course a, a sinister messaging that you have exactly identified of, of telling us all that we're not really worth saving and there's nothing good in us to start with anyway there's nothing good to touch into to speak from that, that we can allow to rise up in us and telling people a good story about who they are is the most empowering thing you can do to them which literally is why michael mann the climate scientist <clears throat> he was so right when he said hopeless um narratives about the future are extremely dangerous because what you really are then saying is we might as well give up on ourselves mm. it's deeply disempowering to remove people's confidence in their own agency and that's that's what courage is about right recognizing that you have some agency that it's worth acting that you have uh, sources of, of kind of moral or spiritual or however you want to frame it power inside yourself that are really there that you can that you can can be proud of that you can speak from that you can make a difference in the world yeah no absolutely and, and give but but giving up on so there's a giving up that's needed and a desperation that's needed but it's not about our humanity it's about a system, the system that you're referring to so yeah. there is a giving up that's needed there is a desperation that's needed that's appropriate there is a fury and an anger and a confrontation that's appropriate but it's not about being human it's about a particular system as you described which is i mean looking back at i mean i'm an anthropologist and the kind of conversations that were happening in say in canada between kind of first nations and jesuits and so on where the jesuits were trying to say we're basically bad uh, you know, and the, and the First Nations people say, no, we're not. Of course, people can be crappy. Of course, that's true. But that's not fundamental nature. It's just amazing seeing how the kind of the belief system within our culture mm. is so, I mean, in cultures, I was saying this to Claire earlier, cultures are so persistent. They're so able to persist. I mean, I'm an anthropologist, so I, I see that. Obviously, that's maybe everyone else will disagree, but just they've got a real power to themselves. And they do that by persuading us that they're natural, that they're given, that they're unchangeable. You know, and our culture is no different that way. It's just like any other culture going, oh, this is how it is. And there's no, and of course they all change. All cultures change, all societies shift. That's why we are where we are now. And, and this is a moment of great transition where we are shifting and changing, whether we shift to no longer being here because we haven't actually transformed our system or whether we actually go, we are worth saving, as you were saying, and we're worth living and our kids mm -hmm. are wonderful. And my God, isn't this amazing to be here? It's, we're alive, mm -hmm. we're gonna be dead, mm -hmm. we're alive. It's amazing that we're here at all. It's a miracle. It's a bloody miracle that we're here. You know, if we kind of touch into that, then it's actually, okay, that system is really unhelpful. Let's change it. But I think when people put their faith in the system and that's where I'm saying the demand needs to be on ourselves rather than demand on the system. We need to demand of it. Obviously that's totally appropriate, but really we're demanding of ourselves collectively and we need to regain that. And I'm looking at that in terms of people's assemblies. And we've been doing that in Scotland, look, developing people's assemblies and looking at having a national assembly that isn't given by government. We tried that one, it didn't work. <laughs> I was part of that, I was part of the Climate Citizen Assembly in Scotland, part of the steering group shaping it with the government. And they didn't allow the breadth of listening to happen, the breadth of evidence. But if we can allow a space, create a space where there's that breadth of listening, we can create the kind of space where we can have a much deeper democracy. And that's that's the shift, but that's that's a different conversation. Mm. That's for tomorrow. So that, I think you make, a, you make a really critical distinction uh, there, Justin, between there is absolutely a desperation that is required and an anger that is required. And the question is, what is the object mm. and how to get, put it this way, how to get the courage rightly directed? Mm. Because it's possible to be courageous in the wrong cause. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's a very important lesson from history. It's possible to give yourself utterly and sacrifice your life utterly and demonstrate superhuman courage mm -hmm. um, in completely the wrong cause. The question is, what's the goal, right? what's the actual uh target here and the target is absolutely not us right the target has got to be as you described it the system that doesn't really serve what's good for people that doesn't really serve any of us yeah. um and i one one kind of metaphor that i've been thinking or model that i've been thinking about recently is the kind of courage that's involved in trying to stop somebody from committing an act of self-harm mm -hmm. which may involve great personal risk Mm. And it's it's something like that on a collective scale, except that doesn't capture the systemic element. But we are in a situation where somebody has not has not noticed collectively the the the, the people who are in in control of the situation haven't noticed that the, the ongoing of the system is an act of, of self harm, and that getting between their weapon and themselves, which is all of us, uh, requires does require sacrifice, and that is the right cause, and there is an appropriate desperation, mm. but not to make humanity itself and the failings of humanity 
um, the object of our dismay. No, that's no. deeply uncreative. No, and it, but it's it's what we're persuaded. It's a fundamental to our to this particular culture of patterning we've got. Because it's a lovely culture. It's got fantastic stuff to it, but it has this story running through it of kind of original sin, and we're basically bad, and you know that gets carried through into. You know, we have science, the rest don't. A whole notion of kind of exceptionalism and being different from everything else. And we're human, we're not other people. This whole weird thing about being alienated and somehow that makes us better and superior as opposed to, Jesus, we've forgotten that we belong. <laughs> you know, it's like, so it's remembering that we belong, remembering it's a miracle. It's amazing to be here. It's absolutely fantastic. And let's carry on being here. But we're persuaded that we're only okay if we somehow ally ourselves with this. I think quite a mad, I, mean, I think your self-harm image is a very good one. It's quite a mad place. And when you, the people in charge of this are people who seem to be able to cut off their relations with their kids and so on, where I'm sure they're very friendly and nice from their activities as perpetuating a system of absolute kind of, well, I think suicide's a good way of looking at it actually. It's a, a system of, it's a suicidal system. We need to stop it in that way. And we need to stop it by remembering who we really are. We're not that system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as, as Claire knows, I, ha I have used before uh, quite frequently the, the, the image of, a, of an act of collective suicide of a crowd running off a cliff. And yes. I think, so, uh, I know that we're, we're running out of time, but a last word on this theme of courage. I think one of the particular kinds of, one of the particular reflections of the courage that's needed now. It, it does, we do live in a moment, Claire and I have spoken about this, that feels like it, it defeats the power of understanding. It requires an act of courage to confront it precisely because it makes no sense at all. It's, it, it's utterly unintelligible that we've ended up in this place. It's, it's got a quality of insanity about it. It's kind of like, you know, I mentioned to, to Claire the film, Don't Look Up. Mm. The reason that film is so painful is because the, the, the quality of it is madness. Mm. It's, a, it's a collectively mad society. And facing up to that requires huge courage. It's a lot, a lot easier to just go on living in one's own private, rational, intelligible world where things do make a kind of sense than trying to confront a global order that makes no sense at all. And, and standing up and saying there is actually some sense that is possible, there is some, there is some way of working this out that does make sense and speaking from a confidence that it's possible that we can once again be sane one yeah. day. Absolutely. No, yeah. that's and I think being on, getting on the streets and getting it out there with other people is where you have that infectious realisation of there being so many others who also care and see the problem that deeply in that way. And I do feel like there's a real need to deepen our democracy and, and, and actually really go for the people's assemblies, citizens' assemblies in a way that is really allowing us to make, make the decisions rather than handing the power over. I think there's a really, there's a very clear way through, there's a very clear route forward actually, that isn't rocket science and rocket science apparently isn't very complex anyway. Um, but yeah, that, that we can do. And part of it that is activism on the street, part of that is activism in our daily lives and part of that is activism actually changing and transforming that system by going for a deeper, deeper democracy as well as deeper courage. But really lovely yeah. talking with you. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. I, I Very good to see you both. A friend of mine from our team said the other day, you know, it used to feel at the start of the start of XR, maybe in like 2018, 2019, like we knew this horrible, horrible secret. Mm. And we had to go and get everybody to realise, you know. And then the cut through on how serious things are happened much faster than I thought it would, if you know what I mean. And yeah. massively because of the school strikers, I think. And massively because of lots of sort of serendipitous mm. events. <clears throat> but it seems to me like now we're in a situation where you could broadly say everyone knows. And mm. yet we're not feeling really particularly that much more hopeful about getting a good outcome, mm. which I think is, well, then it's like the courage to carry on you mm. know, which I think is quite difficult for our movement. I think it's a miracle that we still exist after mm. this length of time. People say they, you know, most social movements have an expected lifespan of about two years. Mm. So we are already a bit of a miracle and that's wonderful, mm. but it's how to find the courage not to, not to give up because people get very tired and it feels, oh, is it really gonna work? How can it work? And all of mm. that. So it's, yeah, I really appreciate you both coming to have uh, have that conversation and um, hopefully it'll just be inspiring for the for the movement as we get ready to to go back out and yeah I'll see you on the streets see ya. Yeah.